So this presentation, I should go slow because it's only today I realized that Shubra is not here. So morning I made this presentation. So let me see. Where is this presentation gone? Yeah. Uh, how much time do I have? I can go slow. Ten minutes. Oh. Is it coming? Uh, can you? <coughs> yeah. So this is about the droopy hood that is a brow dosis and how do we manage the brow dosis. So no financial disclosure. When I speak about brow dosis, I usually like to comment on this. I mean, what Dr. McCord has mentioned. He has mentioned the droopy hood to that of a curtain rod that has loosened, that had fallen, causing folding of the curtain. So that is what the uh, aesthetic surgeon describes as droopy hood. There are numerous causes to it, and one of the most common causes is a dermatocolysis, which is an aging change. So this dermatocolysis basically occurs because of the effect of gravity, number one. There's a bony resorption. There's re uh, loss of the tone of the frontless muscle. And also there's deflation and descent of the soft tissue. So there's a very important paper which was in present when I went for the uh, Japanese Society of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery where this doctor has shown so beautifully how the thickness of the upper lid skin differs. See, in the upper lid, it is uh, near the brow, it is much thicker. And as we come towards the cilia, it is much thinner. So the gravity effect is always there. And most of the cause, uh, causes of aging is because of gravity. So the different causes of drooping, I, one is I have already mentioned age. The second being the facial asymmetry. It can be a mechanical cause. And the most common causes can be a spasm, either blepharospasm, hemifacial spasm, apraxia of lid opening, and also can be a meek syndrome. The seven nerve paralysis is also one of the causes. Because of the seven nerve paralysis, there's loss of tone of the frontless muscle, there's loss of tone of the obliquaries muscle, and the senile ptosis can be one of the cause. Myasthenia itself can be one of the cause. The lacrimal gland prolapse can be one of the cause. So you need to address the situation as per the cause, you need to give the treatment of this brow ptosis. Like this is a young girl, but still you can see everything is hooded out here. So you need to do a surgery and give a much better look. And this is how she looks after the surgical procedure. <coughs> yeah, Vatsala has already mentioned about how do we assess the eyebrow. So this is a beautiful eyebrow. Like if you draw a line vertically from the medial end of the eyebrow, it should touch the ella of the nose. And once you draw a line tangentially, then it should touch the lateral canthus and the lateral part of the eyebrow. And the highest point of the eyebrow lies at the level of the lateral limbus. So this is what we call the eyebrow symmetry. And you should know about the tassel plate show and the brow fat span. So you should always remember that there's a difference between a male and a female eyebrow. Male eyebrows are basically heavier. And they are much at the lower level. They are just at the rim. But the female eyebrows are much at a higher position. And this much above the supraorbital rim. So treatment can be either non-surgical and surgical. Non-surgical, there are multiple ways. Whether it can be injection botulinum toxin type A. Or it can be lasers. Or radio frequency. People now do so much of radio frequency. People use the ultrasound. That is the high food. The high intense ultrasound. And also the dermal fillers. <coughs> so if you see the muscles, all the only elevator of the eyebrow is the frontalis. But all this muscle, whether it's obicularis, the procerus, and the coracatus, these are the muscles which pulls the eyebrow down. So when you do a chemo denovation, you have to target those muscles because these are the muscles which are responsible for pulling the eyebrow down. So you need to touch all these muscles, especially the central group of muscle. As you can see here, also you need to touch the obliquaries, which is a major muscle which pulls the eyebrow down. So this is how we draw it and accordingly we inject the required amount of botulinum toxin. <coughs> so this is how we injected at least three points in the obliquaries. Why we inject in the obliquaries? Because the obliquaries pulls the eyebrow down. So what is the antagonist of obliquaries? It is frontalis. So once the obliquaries becomes weakened, so the frontalis will take an upper hand and will pull the eyebrow up. Okay. 
So these are some of the patients before and after the dermal, I mean injection botulinum toxin. And also sometimes we use the dermal filler. There are different ways of doing it. You can use a needle or you can use a cannula. Cannula is safe because the chance of vascular complication is much less as compared to the needle. And you need to, when you use a needle, you should hit the periosteum. Just pre-periosteum, the product should be there. <coughs> Can you see I'm injecting the three points? I'll show you another technique, what we're doing with the cannula. <coughs> and every time you inject, you have to aspirate so that you don't come up with any vascular complication. So there are different, uh, I mean, literature says that some says you have to wait minimum for eight seconds, but the latest literature says that they got the vascular positive aspiration after 39 seconds. But what I do, I count till 12 seconds, like one, two, three, four. If there is no aspir positive aspiration within the 12 seconds, then I go for a dialing injection. So this is how we do a cannula. This lady, she is a model there in my place and she wanted uh, some amount of the bro lift and she doesn't want to take any botulinum toxin. So this is how I have used a cannula to inject in the brow region. And you can see there's been deflation of the brow. She is quite young. The brow looks much de uh, deflated. And this is the best way of doing a brow, I mean, correction of the droopy hood. And this is, uh, she is otherwise having a good brow. She wanted a little amount of lift. And this is just after the procedure where you can see a beautiful lift and also beautiful reshapening of the eyebrow just with injection dermal filler. So, and third way of giving a lift to the eyebrow is with a thread. There are different types of thread. That is the PDO thread, that is PLL thread, that is PCL thread. But what we initially used to do, we used to do a PDO thread. But what we have realized is the PDO thread lasts maximum for a year. And it is the PLL thread which lasts much more than a year. It might also last for two years. So this is how like one of the lady initially with the PDO thread and this is also pedio thread. You just need to make an entry. And then these are all blunt tip cannula. So it is a safer way of doing. So you, and how much amount of lift you want, you just pull it. And you can see on the table, you'll see the lift of the eyebrow. So this is what you see. So these are the blue colors are the pedio thread. And then you can see the change in the eyebrow before and after the surgical procedures and a little bit about some of the surgical principles. The one of the very common procedure is the internal bropexy. And this is a surgery which we do it along with the blepharoplasty. So this lady, you'll see the blepharoplasty has been planned and then you need to fix the eyebrow tissue deep down to the periosteum so that it doesn't come down. So what we are using, we are using a fiber proline. You can also use a fiber poly polyester that is a poly uh, polyder. Make an incision approximately on the orbital rim, which is 10 centimeter, sorry, 10 millimeter above the orbital rim. And then you fix the soft tissue and also the roof, approximately 10 millimeter above the orbital rim. Why 10 millimeter? Because we know the eyebrow lies approximately, if you measure from here to here, it is approximately a centimeter for the female, especially above the eyebrow. eyebrow. So these are some of the patients before and you can see this beautiful lift along with the upper lid blepharoplasty <coughs> and the internal bropexy. <coughs> Sometimes what uh, I have already mentioned, then along with the orbicularis, the procerus and the corrugators also pulls the lid down. So when you have patient having both a medial and a lateral drooping, so along with doing a uh, internal bropexy, you need to remove some amount of the procerus and the corrugators. Is it clear? Because if you only lift the lateral, the medial will be still drooped, right? So you extend the incision. This is how you check for the corrugators. These are all mimetic group of muscle. That is their originates from the bone and inserts into the skin. So they're very superficial group of muscle. You have to pull the muscle and try to exercise as much amount of possible both the corrugator and also, if possible, some amount of the procerus. <coughs> you can see the whole of the forehead gets full. <coughs> and since you have removed it, so what I'm doing, I'm trying to cover the gap 
which where the procedure uh, corrugator was actually lying and that we have filled up with a filler uh, with a fat so that the chance of post-operative scarring is much less you see this looks so uh, beautiful before and after she also has a medial bulge out so we have removed her corrugator it gives her much better can you see the medial bulge out here well, let me show you this medial bulge that is not present after the surgery so here this is a very simple way of lifting the whole of the eyebrow somehow like sometimes we do use the endoscope i don't have the video because i was not prepared for this talk but also without using an endoscope you can do a endoscopic brow lift okay <coughs> oh this is again a very simple way i think it was first described by guy mastery he have shown that where a small incision you give in the lateral part of the forehead just above the brow try to expose the frontalis muscle so his first technique is what? Like his frontalist muscle is, it does not insert laterally, it is more centrally. So the same frontalist muscle, he pulls it and gives her, I mean stitches to the lateral part of the eyebrow. And this is the same technique, once you expose the frontalis, you can shorten the frontalis or you can plicate the frontalis. You can see I have resected, like how we do for the screen surgery, resected some amount of the frontalis. And now once you strengthen the front list, this front list will be lifting up the eyebrow. <coughs> <coughs> this is a very, uh, I think, beautiful surgical procedure. And it really gives a very good lift. Like, look at here and look at the lift here. This is like, she was very conscious of this. And the otherwise also she was having a very beautiful eyebrow, but she wanted a further lift. And this is how we have given, done with this. Uh, surgical technique look at the beauty like this is from here it has been lifted up to here so th this is a very simple way of doing and especially and also when you have a very big heavy brow especially the males then you can directly go but what happens in the Indian skin the chance of scarring and pigmentation is very high so we do I do not prefer but very rarely I do this and that's why this is one of my very old slide <coughs> You can see this is the gen. He, they look totally different, like right? after the blepharoplasty. Like if you look this and look this picture, he looks so much younger. So there are also different ways of managing this brow ptosis. Sometimes in dermatocalysis, we do something which is called the extended incision or extended excision of the skin. And these are the different types of incision that can be given. And this is how what we do as an extended blepharoplasty. Just remember, for a cosmetic blepharoplasty, the incision should not touch the lateral canthus. But when you do a functional blepharoplasty, which is the extended blepharoplasty, the incision should go at the lowest point of the lateral hooding. So all this hooded area, it needs to be removed. So the incision goes much beyond the lateral canthus. So these are the different points or mar marking points that we put. Always the, I mean, you have to preserve at least 20, uh, 20 millimeter of the tissue from your lash to your eyebrow. That is from the lash to the incision is 10 millimeter of the tissue. From the incision to the eyebrow, another 10 millimeter of the tissue. This is very important so that you don't end up with a lid retraction. So this is one of the patients. So this is really a very hooded lid. And this is how we do a very extended blepharoplasty. Sometimes what we do, you not only do a very extended blepharoplasty, you need to remove the fat along with it. Because of the gravity, the whole of the periorbital fat, especially the roof, has been descended. Here, not only the skin orbicularis that I am re removing. See, there's so much amount of tissue you need to remove. As you can see here, I am also doing an extended blepharoplasty trying to remove the pre neurotic fat, both the medial and the central. And this is the orbital septum. I'm just cutting it away because sometimes it might lead to adhesion and might give a little traction. And here, this is the central fat pad that is being exposed that you can see. So a very extensive surgery, this is being done. And then you have to cauterize it very well because she is very elderly. She'll have lots of systemic issues like diabetes, hypertension. So the amount of tissue that has been removed, the skin, orbicularis, part of the orbital septum, then the part of the lateral fat pen and the part of the central fat pen and the part of the medial fat pen. I think I have also removed some of the roof 
And this is very routinely I do for many of the patients for the hooded lid. So there's so much of fat. This because of gravity, everything has descended so much. So you need to remove some amount of the, uh, <coughs> what is uh, your roof? That is a retro orbicularis oculi fat. And then this is the same way you're doing an internal bropexy. You approximately 10 millimeter from the orbital margin, you mark it, pass the suture to the periosteum, uh, periosteum and then to try to fix the soft tissue that this tissue just approximately 10 millimeter above to your uh, orbital rim, you fix it to the periosteum, and then you can also go for a direct brazier suture. Brazier suture means you need to lift it, you pass the suture from the orbicularis to the arcus marginalis, then to the superior orbicularis in the form of a matrix. So it really gives a very beautiful lift, the lateral lift. You can see here on the ta table, you can see the lat uh, lateral lift. And this is very common in Northeast India. Like we get a very heavy lift in the Northeast India and it really gives a very beautiful correction. So this is just, you can see so much of tissue has been removed and you can see how beautiful it looks. So the extended blepharoplasty, I mean to say that the for patient hearing. Thank you so much, ma'am. And indeed, uh, it's not just the upper eyelid, we need to tackle the eyebrow as well. And you must know all the non-surgical as well as surgical procedures. Uh, like ma'am beautifully described the filler with the cannula, it's quite safe, uh, even though fillers, vascular aspiration has to be checked. But if you're doing it with a cannula, in the eyebrow region, you can give a real, on table, the appearance changes in front. And especially one side you do and the other side is not done, you can show the patient how much improvement you've achieved with the non-surgical method. Surgery remains the gold standard, but aging is still inevitable. These patients after surgery also may eventually need some titration a decade down the line. Always counsel the patients regarding